<laughs> Alexander the Great at the when he saw his life coming to an end, you know, with the, you know he gets sick and all that, wanted to throw himself into the Euphrates, according to our sources, so that they wouldn't be able to recover his body, so that they would be able to worship him afterwards. And so, you know, these are this was in a whole war over his body after between right, Ptolemy and right. yeah. Proteus Peregrinus is on at at the Olympic Games in 165. Uh, CE, and he's going to throw himself into a funeral. Uh, I mean, a a, a, a pyre, a, um, a a big bonfire, basically, and die like Heracles. Again, intentionally, the idea there is they wouldn't be able to recover his bones, and his disciples are standing by, you know, mm. to make sure that this that this all comes off right. It's a great account in Lucian if you get a chance to read it. And wow. then they they see him ascend, and they and and supposedly some voice that he's going up, flying up to Olympus. And then uh, a day or two later, someone comes back to the funeral service, the panegyric that they had there to commemorate this individual and declares that they had seen him back in Athens in the portico of the seven voices walking with a gleaming white toga on or whatever and a garland of white uh, of, of olive on his head and had this encounter with him. And this is a postmortem appearance. And so th <laughs> there's a lot of intentionality going on here. People are trying to get them, get, get these, get their stories into that form intentionally so that they can uh, then receive this exalted knock layman to use the, the German word there afterlife or kind of legacy. They want to be remembered as above, you know, beyond human as like superstars. So you have two things that I think are really interesting about your book, Rick. Again, I got a self plug here. I got like 15 more recordings with you in 4K, by the way, on the Patreon and on the YouTube member thing. If you like hearing what Rick's saying, help support us. I've I like I traveled, I paid out of my own pocket, I made a trip to California, I recorded all this, I edited all this. It's a lot of work. So when people talk about three dollars a month is too much, too bad. I mean, Starbucks isn't handing out free coffee. We kind of live in a world where things cost money. So I worked my butt off. $3, I think that's a heck of a deal for the whole month. You can drop the Patreon after after one month and milk me just to get those videos. So um, I wanted to read something I think is interesting, but first comment about your book. That is this missing body thing that we find about the empty tombs. I tend to think it's legendary narrative, right? It, it has a narrative structure. It's got, it, it just has a punch about it. Matthew really highlights that like the stone's not even moved and Jesus is yet in, like the angel moves it to show you he's not in there, but he's not in there. So like, this is evidence of him being a God. Um, Kalihari, I pronounce it Kalihari. How do you pronounce this? A Kalarho? Galler hallway, yeah, something like Kaler this. I, I was like looking online how to pronounce this. I want to read from book three or section three uh, of book three. Uh, the tomb robbers had been careless in closing the tomb. It was at night and they were in a hurry. At the crack of dawn, Charias turned up at the tomb, ostensibly to offer wreaths and libations. But in fact, with the intention of doing away with himself, he could not bear to be separated from Kalihari and thought that death was the only thing that would cure his grief. When he reached the tomb, he found that the stones had been moved and the entrance was opened. By the way, this was probably written mid first century AD. All right, so the, the, the stone moved and the entrance was open. He was astonished at the sight and overcome by fearful perplexity. Sound familiar? At what had happened. Rumor, a swift messenger, told the Syracusians this amazing news. They all quickly crowded around the tomb, but no one dared go inside until Hermocrates gave an order to do so. The man who was sent in reported the whole situation accurately. It seemed incredible that even the corpse was not lying there. Then Chereus himself determined to go in, in his desire to see Kalihari again, even dead. But though he hunted through the tomb, he found he could find nothing. Many people could not believe it and went in after him. They were all seized by helplessness. One of those standing there said, the funeral offerings have been carried off. It is tomb robbers who have done that. But what about the corpse? Where is it? Because, you know, tomb robbers wouldn't have taken the corpse, according to this. Many different suggestions circulated in the crowd. Just like the gospel say, the disciples stole the body. Chereas looked towards the heavens, stretched up his arms and cried, which of the gods is it? 
then, who has become my rival in love and carried off Kalihari and is now keeping her with him against her will, constrained by a more powerful destiny. That is why she died suddenly, so that she would not realize what was happening. That is how Dionysus took Ariadne and Thesus, how Zeus took Semele, oh, sorry, from Thesus, how Zeus took Semele. It looks as if I had a goddess for a wife without knowing it. Someone above my station. But she should not have left the world so quickly, even for such a reason. Thetis was a goddess, but she stayed with Peleus, and he had a son by her. I have been abandoned at the very height of my love. What is to happen to me? What is to become of, of me? Poor wretch. Should I do away with myself? And who would share my grave? I did have this much to look forward to in my misfortune that if I could not continue to share Kalihari's bed, I should come to share her grave. My lady, I offer my justification for living. You force me to live because I shall look for you on land and sea and in the very sky if I can reach there. This I beg you, my dear, do not flee from me. At this, the crowd broke out in lamentation. Everyone began to lament for Kalihari as though she had just died. Powerful. First century AD novel talking about an empty tomb experience, fear and trembling. The deification of her being missing is evidence that she was taken by the gods to become a god because she was really a goddess. I meant um, there's so many things I highlight in that. And I'm thinking, I'm not saying that the gospels borrowed this. Shoot, they don't even have to know about each other. I'm saying, as you're saying, Rick, there's a game. There's a certain kind of literary structure that you would want to model your figure after. Yeah, it's it's a uh, this is how you would signal in terms of linguistics, in terms of cultural kind of uh, pattern. This is how you would signal that this is what that meant, what that signaled. Uh, the body's gone, deified. That would have been the, that immediate connection was was just implicit there. And so notice there wasn't a lot of even justification for that there. They didn't go and do any work to try and draw any line why that would be the case. It's because that would have been the clear way that that would have registered in the, in the ancient psyche and mind. And so, you know, I think that you could see over my, and, and this is one of the things that if you see this, this pattern over this, over a spread of nearly a thousand years, and some of the examples that I give there is well entrenched, you know? And so, um, that's, it's kind of the unavoidable sort of, uh, implication of that. And so this is how you would, this is how you would speak to that. And now the gospels have to work overtime to try and present that because they're using the word resurrection. And so, but they need to, so in the epilogical content that you get at the end of each one of those narratives, there's a, a lot of work to be done to make sure that those signals are, are present and clearly registering for the reader. So that there's no mistaken interpretation over what they mean. And so Jesus is able to, you know, be touched and grabbed and all of this, but at the same time, he can walk through walls. He can eat broiled fish, but at the same time, he could disfigure himself such that he's not even recognizable. Um, so his physicality there is important because that's also, it just distinguishes him from being a ghost. And in fact, in one of the episodes, I think it's in, was it Luke at the end there? He, he in fact, try, is explicit. I'm not a ghost, you know, right. he's trying yeah. to make sure you understand that and in no uncertain terms. But at the same time, he's got all of these, um, you know, uh, theistic properties is these godlike properties. Um, and so he, it, which, which are their way of saying, look, he's not, he's not what he was before this, these able to do things. Now it's fuzzier than that because this isn't, I mean, the, the theologian will go back and read that and think there's some hard category there. It's a little bit like Gandalf going from what was it? Gandalf, the gray to Gandalf, the white or something in the, you know, he, he, you know, it's next level. Right. A little bit like that going on, but it's not this hard, like ontological theological category that you'd get in like a systematic theology or something like that. Because you've got the, tr you know, the transfiguration on the mountain. That's kind of a preview of it, right? Right. He basically gets up there and then you get the, the divine voice that, you know, they're getting ready to set up the three shrines, right? What was it to Elijah and uh, uh, Moses. Moses? Yeah. 
And, uh, and then they were going to give one to Jesus also. And then the divine voice comes and says, no, 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 no. He's not like them. They, yeah, they did raise, they did ascend also. But this is, this is a demigod. This is my beloved son. You know, distinguish him. And so they were going to set up three cenotaphs up there, three little shrines, right? That's kind of what the, te the, the segment indicates. And so anyway, so that's the idea is that he's exalted. He's being exalted in the text. This was the protocol. This is the only way I think they could have gotten this off the ground in any kind of trajectory that moved into the, Rome, the, the Mediterranean world. What's interesting is if you look at trajectories of earliest Christianity that moved in other directions, like, say, down into Africa or like to the east into Parthia or something like that, they don't do this kind of work the same way or at all. Even like Manichaeanism isn't they're not interested in dressing. Jesus doesn't have these properties. And, and you see that even surviving in some ways into early uh, Islamic tradition. The Jesus that's there isn't dressed up like you know, in, in these uh, cultic forms that you would see prev prevalent in the Mediterranean world. He's, he's a prophet more in that context. If you go down into like uh, Gnostic tradition, they're, they're struggling. They've got their own kind of way of painting him. You know, it's not, they, they want him to shed his body kind of in a platonic way. So, and so you get to see that in some of the, like Marcy and I, and some of the other Gnostic traditions where they're trying to get rid of the body because they would see that as a negative thing that he would have physicality afterwards, because that's, that's a bad philosophical idea. And so, 